Welcome to Reddit Aliens. People of Reddit, what's your scariest true story? Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Wednesday, August 17th, 1977. I stopped at a convenience store to buy a soft drink. As I approached the door, I noticed customers were lying on the floor and a man was at the register wearing a ski mask and holding a pistol aimed at the clerk. I heard tires squealing, turned and saw two police cars come flying into the parking lot. I turned, headed for my car, but I had to drop to the ground because shots were being exchanged. I rolled under my car, a 1973 Chevrolet Caprice, and hid. After about eight to nine shots, I saw the man with the mask lying on the ground. He was wounded. I drove that Chevy with a bullet hole in the door for three more years. Once hydroplaned into three lanes of traffic, my car spun 90 degrees or so it seemed at 75 miles per hour. I remember everything slowing down and seeing the side of the car next to me mid-drift through my windshield while still going about 75. It was surreal. I had to pull over and do some deep breathing after that. I remember seeing a group of unidentified flying objects in the sky one evening returning home. I was not drunk. It was a clear night, sky full of stars, and this group of random lights flying in one direction, but not straight like a plane. I still don't know what it was, and part of me still thinks I witnessed actual UFOs, although there could be a plausible explanation. Not sure what that would be, though. This is one I've been thinking about lately. This happened to me maybe 15 years ago, as far as I remember. I would have been about 15 to 16 years old. I only had this experience once and have never had it again since. One morning or afternoon, I woke up suddenly in a panic and jumped out of bed, and for some reason I thought my family abandoned me and were gone forever. I looked outside and could see that both my parents' cars were gone. I started crying hysterically, feeling scared and utterly hopeless. The more time went on, the more hopeless I felt and the more hysterical I got. I was at home alone, so no one saw me in this state. I think the crying lasted about maybe 10 to 15 minutes. When I managed to calm down, I was still in this disoriented state. For some reason, I also thought there was no way to contact anyone. It's really hard to explain. I turned the TV on and started looking through some support pages for a Sky TV to figure out a way to contact my mother. Eventually, I picked landline phone up, yet still thinking I had no way to contact her. I rang her, and she picked up, and I said something strange to her, something like, why did you take everything? I think I was trying to ask why there was no way to contact her. My mother was a bit worried, because the question didn't make sense, and I sounded confused. At the moment, she was talking back to me, I seemed to return to reality. I'm a bit rusty on the details, because it was so long ago, so sorry if some of the details sound vague. Not sure what happened, but I think maybe it was some form of sleepwalking. As I said before, this is the one and only time this happened, and I have no history of sleepwalking apart from this experience, assuming that's what it was. Some of the behavior seems contradictory, but I guess it's because my mind was so disoriented. Seems silly, but at the time, I was absolutely terrified. TL, DR, I woke up crying hysterically, thinking my family abandoned me and that there was no way to contact anyone. I fainted during the wildfire season, combo of poor air quality and laughing hysterically at a story and timber, I fell straight back, smacked my head so hard I had a tennis ball sized knot, but I also stopped breathing for nearly four minutes, I was actually dead. I remember being woken up, I remember the rest of that night, the next day is clear to me, but the next day, so two days later, is lost from my head. I have recollection of that day that doesn't match anywhere close to what everyone else told me about it. But the scary part, I have solid memories of being outside at a field and seeing a litter of bunnies, petting them, playing with them, watching them duck in and out of their hole. Never happened. But the first thing I said when I started breathing again after fainting was, tried the bottom of the rabbit hole, but bunnies everywhere. When I was asked what happened, going down the rabbit hole is what I did when I stopped breathing, I suppose. Not a personal experience, but a friend of mine left to go to university in London. She had brought a one-bedroom flat in a block of flats in the city. Over the first few nights, all was fine. Until the morning, she began to notice cushions on the floor, which were on her sofa the night before, and magazines not where she left them. Slightly unnerved, she ignored it. She always made sure she locked the doors and windows at night so no one could get in. However, one night she woke up to this day, can't recall why, and saw someone stood in her bedroom. She screamed to the person and ran off. Her scream was so loud that a neighbor in the next flat woke up and rushed to see if she was okay. 
Police were phoned and the flat was searched. Nothing stolen and no sign of anyone in the flat. The police thought she might have been dreaming or even had sleep paralysis. One thing she noted is the front door was unlocked. Even though she was adamant, she locked it. Feeling scared, she wanted to move back home, but instead her landlord changed the locks and an alarm was installed in the property. She even had a few of her classmates stay with her a few nights after it happened. Weeks passed, nothing else happened, until she got a knock at the door. She answered it, and police are outside. They sit down with her, and apparently they did an early morning raid on a man a few streets away. However, when searching his property and seizing his devices, they found loads of photographs and videos of her sleeping using a night vision camera. It turns out he was an old tenant that was evicted from the flat and was a known offender to police for voyeurism offenses and some additional ones, but she doesn't know what they are. When questioned, he quickly admitted who the photos were of and the address of the tenant, which police then linked to the original complaint a few weeks prior. It turns out the guy had been going into her flat at night using his own key that he had made a copy of after returning the original key when he left. He said he would come into the flat and just watch her sleep and take photos and video sometimes. He would sit on her sofa and read her magazines. Anyway, the guy was sectioned under Mental Health Act and is in a secure hospital. However, my friend has had trouble sleeping ever since. Last I heard, she now owns a dog and gets her locks changed regularly due to paranoia, puts cups on the handles, and has sensor alarms throughout her home. I can only imagine what this would do to you psychologically when trying to relax or sleep. I was around four at the time, and I remember it was around, I would say, five because my mom was getting off of work. My dad was sleeping so he could go to work. He does night shift. And I was upstairs with my older sister. We heard a knocking of some sort but didn't think much of it as her house was old and the foundation wasn't as good as it used to be. We laughed at office, ooh, so scary, who's at the door? But then it would get more aggressive. This continued for maybe a half hour till it got really quiet. My dad woke up as he sleeps lightly and the little creak of a floorboard would make him scream, shh. Me and my sister were scared as we thought he was going to yell at us. We did it. He said, was that you? And my sister, who was a few years older, then replied, no, we thought it was just our house. This caused my dad to go around checking to see if someone was in our house, but he found nothing. But when he said, must have been our house, that's when it started up again, starting with light ticks to loud bangs. I don't know what it was until I heard my mom pull in the drive and her shouting, who are you? A few minutes later, police sirens were blaring. Turns out it was a guy maybe four to five doors down trying to lure me and my sister. It's been 10 years since then, but it still scares me to this day wondering what would have happened if my mom never noticed him in our garden. Kinda long story. When I was in high school, me and my best buddy at the time decided to skip school. Somehow, for whatever reason, we decided to spend the day on the computer looking up scary stories and videos of people who encountered the devil or some type of paranormal activity. Fast forward to nighttime. We met up with another buddy at the elementary school playground down the street and we're telling him about all the scary shit we found and out of nowhere we all heard the sound of laughing coming from underground best way i can describe it is if i was standing on a table and someone was right below it laughing only lasted for about three seconds but was loud enough that it shut us all up and we just kind of froze after that we went home i was so scared i woke up my parents and told them everything i want to say this was in like 2009 but i've only told the story a few times since then because i know it sounds ridiculous we had went back like the next week to try and recreate the sound like maybe it was something we stepped on, but no luck. I don't know what happened. I was delivering pizzas for a short amount of time because I thought it would be fun. I had to go deep into bum F Egypt that I didn't even know we delivered to. The drive was about 50 minutes. I try not to judge houses like this since I lived in a creepy looking old house growing up, so it didn't phase me too horribly. I got there, and it was an older man, probably in his 60s or 70s. He had a walker, so he asked if I could come in and set it on the table. Eff, I don't get paid enough. Whatever. He's old, so I do it. He closes the door and locks it. Great. I continue on like I didn't notice and set it down to the kitchen. He stands in the doorway and asks if I want to party with him. Good thing I'm a natural born liar, so I told him I'd love to, but my car has a timer for two and a half minutes. And if I'm not back in and driving, the police are automatically called and sent to my location, and it only turns off when I'm back on store property. He left his walker right where it was and fast walked to unlock or open the door. I'm glad he fell for this. 
Well, that was very quick thinking by this pizza delivery guy. Really smart. My dad and I were in London for a long weekend. We had just watched part of the London Marathon and were headed to Camden. When we were at the tube station, we suddenly heard a woman screaming. A guy had passed out and landed on the tracks. The woman who had screamed was shouting, Somebody, press something! Presumably referring to some kind of alarm button on the wall that she hoped existed. Such a button did not exist. We started to hear the familiar sounds of a train approaching. Some people were desperately trying to grab hold of the man from the platform. My dad ran over to try and help. The sound of the train was growing louder and louder as it came nearer to the station. I was in a full state of panic by now. I had no idea what to do. I was frantically looking around while pacing in place, yet I was somehow frozen. As I was looking around, I saw a tourist couple. The man was taking photographs of everyone panicking and running around while his partner just stood still, looking bewildered and confused. I'm pretty sure I was crying by this point. My heart has never beaten as fast as it did in those moments. The efforts of lifting the guy off the tracks were not going well, and at several points it looked like some of the people helping him might end up on the tracks too. The train, still approaching, was coming around a curve before entering the station. We could just begin to see the lights. Some people at the far end of the station, opposite to where the man was, started jumping up and down, waving their arms, screaming and shouting, in the hopes that maybe, just maybe, the train driver would see it and stop in time. Suddenly, we could hear the screeching of metal on metal. The driver had seen the waving. The train stopped about three feet short of decapitating the guy. The driver, having almost killed a man, however accidentally, slammed the door to the driver's compartment as he got out. I can't say I blame him. Once the train was stopped, some bystanders were able to get the guy back on the platform. He had face planted onto the tracks. There was blood streaming down his face from a cut on his forehead. Medics eventually arrived and took him away to get stitches, etc. My dad and I eventually calmed down and got on the next train to Camden. The woman who initially raised the alarm and urged people to press something was on the same train right next to us. The three of us looked like we had just come from the wars, passing a bottle of water between us and sitting wide-eyed and exhausted. Interestingly, the night before my father and I had been at a different tube station where there had just installed the plexiglass wall type of thing at the end of the platform with sliding doors that would only open once a train was in the station and fully stopped. I had remarked to my dad what a clever idea that was. It must prevent a lot of accidents and save the drivers a lot of trauma. Not sure how scary it is, but here we go. In the last four years of high school, I was suffering from extreme nightmares. And I don't mean someone chasing your kind. I mean gore, people I love dying, etc. It was happening every night, vivid nightmares that to this day I still remember. It was so bad that at one point I wasn't sleeping at all. I became dependent on my friend to FaceTime me and talk with me until I fell asleep because it became the only way I could do it. I tried relaxing, I tried pills that are supposed to lower anxiety, I even consulted an online group that was into supernatural things. Nothing helped. I was so exhausted that I could barely function. I've seen some weird things that now when I think about it, I might have just been hallucinating because of exhaustion. Three years ago, the nightmare stopped along with any kind of dreaming. I would just close my eyes and wake up the next day. To this day, if I sleep more than five hours, I will feel like shit. A little more than a year ago, I started dreaming again. Not often. One dream every few months, but lately I started having nightmares again, and I'm not sure if I'll be able to handle one more nightmare streak again. I don't want to be afraid to sleep anymore. Not exactly super scary, but very unsettling for 12-year-old me. Some friends and I were walking a nearby creek bed. Just imagine a creek that has dried up to a small stream several feet wide and only about four inches deep, max. We walked around a bend in the creek and started to smell a horrible, rotten smell. Keep going down and around the next bend are about 8 to 12 dead dogs, all in different stages of decomposition, all seemingly bludgeoned to death. We kind of investigated further, and it became very obvious that these dogs had in fact been bludgeoned to death by someone, if not blatantly beaten and tortured. Lots of broken bones, caved-in skulls, and the bodies were filled with maggots and smelled horribly. We got out of there, but we didn't even want to imagine what where they were. They were all different breeds and ages as well. Just a real freak show moment. I was eight or nine and home alone with my grandmother. Two young teenagers appeared at the door claiming that my older brother, who was 11, was in trouble. That they had seen kids chasing him at the mall a short distance away. We did not know these kids, but my grandmother decided to check things out, telling me to stay at home and not to answer the door. 
but I opened the door. Because the same guys came back and knocked again, they started asking me questions and trying to flatter me, before suddenly becoming menacing and threatening to lock me in a closet next to the front door. What they didn't know is that the back wall of the closet had been removed to create an entry for the laundry room and a downstairs suite, so I bolted like a rabbit into the closet myself and locked myself into the suite. I never told my mom or grandmother because I was afraid of getting in trouble. I just hid until I heard the car. To this day, I have no idea what they wanted. We figured they were casing the house for some reason, but unsure why, unclear how they knew my brother if at all, or how such young kids would be so confidently involved in a plot like that. It was sincerely weird and scary. I'm a trucker. I've traveled many roads, some four lane, some six lane, but most two lane. One night, around 10 p.m., I was traveling near a small town in Missouri, southeast of Kansas City. The road I can't recall because I've traveled so many, and yet so few times. I do know that it was near I-44, as I was headed towards Springfield, Ohio. I came up on a stoplight, and I was looking ahead, saw what looked to be a person standing roughly a quarter mile up the road with that obvious, can I catch a ride hand sign. I figure, why not? So once the light turned green, I eased my rig up to speed enough to get to this person quickly yet easily. I pulled off slightly, with the now easily viewable young lady in view right in front of me. She grabbed a bag and jumped on the side steps of the passenger side of my truck and asked where I was going. I stated my destination, and she said, perfect, I'm actually headed to New York City to make it big. I invited her inside, and she opened the door and climbed in. After takeoff, she started talking about fame and fortune, and making a name for herself in the Big Apple. She appeared to be late teens, early 20s, with clothing that stood out a bit. Her sweater was tied and hung around her waist, a short sleeve v-neck shirt that gave credence to her bust, and cut off shorts that stopped toward her upper mid-thigh. Now, I have no ill intent for this woman, just making observations. It being 2014, I haven't seen this kind of dress since the early 2000s. After about 30 minutes of her jabbering on about what she wanted to become, I finally reached the interstate and made my turn to go eastward. After a few hours, I was coming up on being done for the night and planned to make my stop at a truck stop just outside St. Louis. A couple hours ago, she asked if she could get some sleep in the bunk of my truck. I said, sure, no problem. Everything's made. Just lay down and catch you some Z's and I'll wake you when I'm ready to stop for the night. Well, I started hollering to the bunk of my truck to let her know I'm fixing a stop for the night and I got no response. I tried a couple more times and to no avail. I figured the gal was probably zonked out hard and I'd wake her when I stopped to fuel up my truck. Before parking to let her hike into the main cabin to find another ride or use the facilities or whatever, I pull in, set my brakes, unbuckle and clamber into the back behind the curtains to find that she's gone. Not there. Her bag was gone and the bed wasn't even messed up. Thinking maybe she climbed out of the bunk side door without my knowing, I gave it a tug. Nope. Still shut and still locked. Standing there confused, I couldn't make out what had happened. The entire trip, I had been traveling anywhere from 40 to 70 miles per hour and never stopped until now after I picked her up. Safe to say I couldn't sleep that night and not only was I late for my delivery because I couldn't sleep, I could never bring myself to pick up another hitchhiker again. The story of the ghost hitchhiker seems pretty cool. I'd read more about it. Scariest thing that happened to me was I had a really bad hay fever attack, pollen allergy, which caused a hernia when I was on my way home from college. It was literally my last day, with me finishing my final exam, I was 19 at the time. The hernia was the size of a tennis ball in my groin. I was 5 minutes from home. I struggled back as I knew it would be quicker for my dad, who was home, to take me to the hospital than wait for an ambulance. As soon as he saw me, the even mom rushed to the hospital, which was 10 minutes from my house. I was rushed through A&E, as the seriousness of the hernia turned out to be strangulated, which was so painful I started to lose some consciousness as doctors tried to force the hernia back in. It seems they didn't want to operate and took my dad shouting for a more experienced doctor, then was still trying to force the hernia back in me to stop. I had surgery 25 hours later by UK medical practices that surgery should have been within 8 hours due to me being at the highest level of emergency at this point. When I had the surgery to repair the strangulated hernia, I didn't feel right at all. I complained to doctors and nurses for days who kept fobbing me off as just another surgery pain it's normal. I didn't eat for four days or drink anything as my body just rejected it. My family also complained whilst I got worse day by day. 
On the fifth day, I had had enough and demanded to go home, but a junior doctor noticed my skin beginning to turn gray and my stomach starting to balloon. I was rushed to a CT scan and woke up four weeks later after being placed in a coma. Turns out, the amount of time I waited for surgery and during surgery, they cut my intestine without checking nearly cost me my life. I went septic. Every organ failed, including my lungs, where I was put on an oxygen machine in ICU as my lungs were filled with literal poison. They had to cut away 5 centimeters of dead tissue of my intestine, I had over 10 blood transfusions throughout those 4 weeks in a coma, and over 15 surgeries. I woke up with no knowledge of this, but my mom, aunts, dad, uncles in tears that I had woken up. I had so much amnesia due to the coma, I had to be told repeatedly I had been in a coma for 4 weeks. They didn't tell me the seriousness of it for a week, as they said the shock could kill me. I had priests coming to visit who would say, someone up there must love you, son. I spent a year of my life, 24 hours a day, on a vac machine to rebuild tissue of my stomach, which was left open due to the amount of infection caused by me going septic. I have no stomach, but a massive scar which destroyed all my confidence, and to this day, I am still the same. This was 10 years ago, the scariest thing that ever happened to me in my life. My parents were told to come up and say bye at one point, which when my mom told me, and burst into tears in the ICU, I will never forget.